Hi, it's Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for our Facebook live chat with Dr. Jacob Hunter on acoustic neuroma. We do apologize for the delay in starting. We've had kind of a lot going on here. But if you didn't know, so Dr. Hunter is an expert in the anatomical structure of the inner ear and neurological conditions that can affect them. So we're going to be talking and taking all of your questions about that as well as acoustic neuromas today. Before we start, don't forget to like and share the conversation with your friends and your loved ones. We want to make sure this information gets out as far as it can. And also, we want to remember that Dr. Hunter can't comment on specific cases. We can talk in generalities, but we can't answer specific, this is what's happening to me type questions. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Again, I thank you for joining us, and thank you for being here, Dr. Hunter. Thank you for the invitation. It should be a wonderful chat today. Wanted to find out. Just to start off, I know there are lots of questions about acoustic neuroma. Sometimes people get misdiagnosed, sometimes they get correctly diagnosed. What exactly is going on with an acoustic neuroma? So an acoustic neuroma is more of an historical term okay. that we believed it was a, a benign tumor on the acoustic nerve. Okay. We now generally think of these tumors as what we call vestibular schwannomas. So okay. schwannoma meaning a benign tumor uh, a benign nerve growth on the balanced nerve within okay. the same area, what we generally call the internal auditory canal, where okay. also the cochlear nerve runs. Gotcha. That's not to say that you can still have a cochlear schwannoma, but generally we, we think of acoustic neuromas as vestibular schwannomas, which as I mentioned, a benign growth on the balanced nerve uh, that can affect a number of functions of the ear, balance, hearing, okay. ringing, pressure, okay. headaches, um, and so when we eventually go in and remove them, we find that a significant portion, and we're talking greater than about 85% of tumors in this location tend to be vestibular schwannomas. Okay, good to know. So, you know, don't forget, be sure to ask your questions in the comment section of this live feed. We have one here. What are symptoms of acoustic neuroma? So, so I mentioned one of the, uh, some of them already. So mm -hmm. tinnitus, uh, so ringing in your ear. Uh, people can present with hearing loss. Sometimes okay. that can even be sudden loss. So okay. uh, it was just presented at a recent meeting of ours that even though you might recover the hearing, that's not to say that you still should have a tumor. So it's generally recommended that patients still get an MRI okay. when you have a recovering uh, sudden hearing loss. Okay. Uh, balance complaints, which can span what we call vertigo, dizziness, disequilibrium, imbalance. Uh, mm -hmm. While many people have dizziness and experience dizziness at one right. time or another in their life, occasionally that can be indicative of maybe a tumor going on. Okay. Um, Is it, does it have to be quite a lot of dizziness? Does it have to be ongoing? Just once? One generally, I mean, not one. I, personally, I don't think one patient's the same or one, there's not one similar pattern. We do right. recognize that a lot of patients with these tumors do develop balance problems. Okay. And the easiest way I can chalk that up to is the fact that it's slowly causing the balanced nerve in that ear mm -hmm. to not work as well as it was when it's without a tumor. Okay. And so a lot of patients never experience any dizziness. But you do question that some people have a, a momentary bout of dizziness that might be temporarily a few days, a few weeks, okay. and you might... I, the way I visualize this is that it's been a sudden decrease in that nerve function. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's almost that their, their, their head's a little off center temporarily and then okay. the other ear picks it up and after a week or two or even a few days, they don't notice any balance complaints. Okay. Um, headaches are another uh, presenting symptom. Uh, I mean, it's interesting studies have shown that you diagnose somebody with a vestibular schwannoma and sure enough, the in incidence of headaches go up afterwards. So it's difficult to say whether that's the chicken or the egg. What's is the headache the result of the, the vestibular schwannoma or not? It's, we okay. can't always say that. Okay, good to know. So we've got a couple questions coming in. We have one here from Cece and one for Stephanie. We're gonna take Cece's question first. She asks, can radiation therapy be an option for an acoustic neuroma? It can be. Uh, so we generally look at three management options. Mm -hmm. uh, generally nowadays, we tend to observe tumors. And the general rule of thumb is a tumor under two centimeters in, in its greatest dimension, or 20 millimeters. Okay. So anything under two centimeters, we generally watch that tumor initially. Mm -hmm. So observe. 85 to 95% of tumors that are growing will stop growing after radiation. Wow, that's good to know. So we have a related question here from Stephanie. And Stephanie asks, 
In the case of recurrence, after you've surgically removed it, what are the treatment options at that point? Generally, it's initially observation, and at least here in our practice, we generally will radiate if it were to grow after we surgically removed it. So okay. we, we recognize that the facial nerve is an important feature and can be a, a symptom or a side effect or a consequence of surgery. And so we'd much rather leave a little bit of tumor in the patient, mm -hmm. preserving the function of the facial nerve, with the idea that, hey, maybe not all the tumor comes out, but at least the patient will be able to wake up and have no facial weakness whatsoever. Okay. So that means we still need to watch it. Now, if it were to grow, we generally would watch it grow, and depending on how quickly it grew, uh, and when that growth did occur, and there's no guarantee that it would ever would grow, uh, then we would consider, uh, we generally offer radiation uh, if there's subtotal removal of the tumor that ends up growing at a later date. Okay, okay. Good question, Stephanie. Thanks for asking. So when you're looking at treating an acoustic neuroma, what are the, are the goals to preserve or return hearing, or are there other goals at play? Uh, that's a good question. So generally, I counsel patients, if you, you lose your hearing, you're not going to get it back. Okay. Um, it, it depends on the patient, we recognize. We recognize patients that tend to have uh, greater dizziness or headaches are more inclined to pursue treatment, specifically surgery. Okay. Um, I'd like to think and I, I don't want to say specifically I speak for my partners, but I, I'd like to think that ultimately we want the patient to be happy and have a high quality of life. And right. these are benign tumors. Uh, more often than not, they do not grow. So yes, obviously it grew from nothing to, to something that's obviously been picked up on the MRI, but the idea is an average tumor is diagnosed at about 1.0, 1.1 centimeter in size. It's pretty small. Pretty small. Again, under that two centimeter mark. Of all tumors ranging in size from two millimeters to four centimeters, we recognize only 40% of those tumors grow. Wow. And of all those tumors, generally speaking, only 30% require intervention. Now, we also recognize the larger tumors tend to be more indicative of growing, which makes sense mm -hmm. because it actually took some time for it to grow to be that large. Right. So larger tumors tend to mean they'll tend to grow, whereas much smaller tumors, somewhere under the lines of under five millimeters, very, very unlikely to grow. So okay. let's say a patient comes in with that sub five millimeter tumor. I mean, their quality of life is probably pretty good. It depends on why they got the MRI in the first place. Did they notice some hearing loss? Did they notice some dizziness? It's generally counseling, hey, okay. you should watch this. Um, you might not ever have to make a decision about this. Uh, and age does play a, a role in that. It's one thing to make that counseling to a 20 something year old patient as right. compared to somebody who's 70. Uh, and it's it's catered to the individual, but um, it, I mean, ultimately, we want I mean, we want to treat our patients as we would want to be treated ourselves. Of course. And so, right. if, if 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 the quality of life issue is of a dizziness and a headache issue, we'll talk to you about about those options. If it's like, listen, I don't even know I really have it, and it's small enough, I'd, we tell you to come back in six to twelve months and let's see if it's grown or done anything. Okay, some good things to think about there. So we have a question from from Cecil. And so it's a little bit about Cecil's. It looks like had an acoustic neuroma back way back in 2004, just had 85% hearing loss in the right ear with tinnitus, had a gamma knife procedure to stop the growth, and have had any progressive prob problems. The question is, I was wondering if there are any new procedures in research to improve any nerve damage. Uh, so from a hearing perspective, no. Um, I, well, I, I don't want to say that as unilaterally as Not I so did. Definitive. Um, there is research and discussion about cochlear implants. And okay. that is a difficult, there's controversy on that. And with the idea that, I mean, this is a tumor that's on the balanced nerve. We generally take the balanced nerve and the hearing nerve when we go in for surgery. Okay. Um, with the idea that we want to remove as much, if not all the tumor as possible. Mm -hmm. So if we remove the hearing nerve, cochlear implant won't work. Okay. Um, there is some push, and some people have done this in the past, uh, trying to preserve the cochlear nerve as an attempt to preserve hearing in those patients with hearing. Okay. Uh, and we do offer that option for patients to go in and preserve hearing if they do have hearing. But even if we try to maintain the integrity of the cochlear nerve, we recognize we've even implanted those patients with a cochlear implant. No guarantee the cochlear implant works. So for patients with unilateral, what we call sporadic vestibular schwannomas, mm -hmm. um, from a hearing perspective, um, we're kind of stuck 
with what we, I mean, we can try a cochlear implant, but unlikely. Okay. Another option, though, is for a patient with bilateral tumors, and those patients are patients with diagnosed neurofibromatosis type 2. So they have it on both, both ears. They have multiple tumors. Uh, okay. And so there is a technology, and this has been around, I think it was first implanted in 1979, but an auditory brainstem implant. So it's with the idea that no cochlear nerve connects either ear, and that we place an implant at the brainstem to rehabilitate the ability to hear and uh, the outcomes aren't great in the sense that it's I mean we're not being able to carry easy conversation they really those patients really rely on lip reading uh, but for those patients that are NF2 patients um, okay. an auditory brainstem implant is something that's always discussed with those patients but for those unilateral patients we're, we're, we're not any farther along from a hearing re restoration uh, question okay okay really good question Cecil so we've got another question here, and I think this is a pretty common one. How does somebody know, or when would somebody know they have an acoustic neuroma versus just an ear earache? They're having ear aches, ear problems. And then that is a very good question. And ultimately, the only way we know a patient has a, a, a vestibular schwannoma is we obtain an MRI. And right. there's general recommendations on when to obtain an MRI. By no right. means would I ever tell a, a family member or a friend or even a patient saying, hey, an earache, I'm worried about an acoustic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I again, I want to emphasize I'm using acoustic vestibular schwannoma interchangeably. Right. But those patients with asymmetric hearing, uh, mm -hmm. and there's certain standards or definitions we use to define what's asymmetric, what's the difference in hearing. Mm -hmm. Unilateral ringing in one ear. Um, right. Those are generally some things, those are hard and fast indications to say, hey, we should really get an MRI. But... A counsel in those patients with asymmetric hearing loss, mm -hmm. only about four percent, it's generally about two to five percent, do you actually pick up a tumor. So every hundred patient that comes oh, wow. in with a unilateral hearing loss, it is very rare that we identify. And we always see patients who come in who ha happen to have a random MRI for mm -hmm. a random reason, and sure enough, what we call an incidental finding, where we pick up a lot of tumors that way. Gotcha. So um, there's a number of reasons to get the MRI, but ultimately, an MRI is going to be the diagnosis. Uh, the test to diagnose whether or not there's one there. Okay, okay, really good question. Thanks for submitting that. So we've got a different question here. These are lots of treatment questions today. This is this is good. I know you do a lot of this. So here's a different one. Which type of radiation treatment do you most commonly perform, and why do you recommend this over the others? So, and that's a good question. There, there are generally conceived or thought to be two types right now: uh, gamma knife radiation, uh, which is single fractionated therapy. <laughs> Sorry, not single fraction. Single fraction uh, therapy, meaning it's a, it's a one-time shot and you're done. Mm -hmm. and we generally do that here at UT Southwestern. Uh, cyber knife, which is a kind of a hypofractionated, so it's five treatments, uh, is another option. And historically, we would tell you, and I think a lot of other neurotologists and neurosurgeons out there would tell you, uh, gamma knife is the recommended way to go. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's been some recent literature to suggest that cyber knife is probably just as safe, is just as effective, uh, that has the same outcomes. Okay. I mean, one could argue it's radiation, and there's slight subtle differences between them. Okay. And historically, it was thought gamma knife would have been the more appropriate uh, treatment. And again, we recommend that here. Um, but some data is starting to come out that maybe cyber knives, the outcomes aren't any different. Okay. So for some of our viewers who may not be as well versed in those type of things, what's the difference between a gamma knife and a cyber knife? Mainly the number of treatments. So gamma knife is going to be one shot. Uh, mm -hmm. Cyber knife is going to be... Uh, somewhere along the lines of about five shots, so five different okay. visits. From a patient perspective, that's probably the easiest way of describing it. Okay, that works. That's a good, simple explanation. All right, so we've got a different question here, and I've this person asks, I've heard that acoustic neuroma can affect your spinal cord. Is that accurate? So those patients with neurofibrom neurofibromatosis type 2 uh, do require imaging of their spinal cord to pick up other tumors. Okay. Uh, and those tumors tend to be what we call meningiomas, another benign growth of uh, cells, which actually can appear very similar on an MRI in and around the, the, what we call the cerebral pontine, cerebral pontine angle. Uh, but if they're diagnosed with NF2 or there's a suspicion of NF2, we get spinal cord imaging to evaluate for any other tumors. Okay. The incidence of NF2 is very, very, very rare. It's an hereditary disease, albeit okay. some people can have spontaneous uh, mutations. But 
And the only way we really concern about that is when either they have a family history or we have an MRI that shows multiple tumors and or bilateral uh, uh, vestibular show Okay, good to know. All right, great question. So we are already more than about halfway through our chat, so now's a great time to ask those questions. We gotta get Dr. Hunter back to the clinic today. So please put them in the comment section. We'll take as many more as we can get to. Definitely before we, before we get much further, I wanted to thank the Acoustic Neuroma Association for helping spread the word about this chat. It's certainly a very important topic. So one of the things we were just talking about was, um, you mentioned genetics. And this was a question that came in before the chat that I don't think we can tag this person, but they were wondering if acoustic neuroma, is that a genetic condition? Is there, does it play any sort of role? Uh, as of right now, we don't, we don't know. Um, uh, there are people that are, uh, groups that are actively looking into certain genes and certain molecules that might suggest whether a tumor might grow um, okay. or not grow. Um, so I'd like to think we'd be having a better understanding of that in the future, but as of right now, um, while I ask, and we generally ask every single patient, do you have a history of intracranial tumors or do you have a family history of vestibular schwannomas? Okay. Um, we are unaware of any specific genetic uh, association. Okay, okay, good question, good to know. So a question that I had, we've talked a lot, we've talked about cyber knife and gamma knife and micro surgeries. What are, are there any complications people should know about before, before going into a surgery? Uh, well, let's go to surgery. So mm -hmm. from a surgical perspective, uh, I mentioned facial nerve injury, but I'll, I, I kind of, I guess, go through the, the, the list as though we're talking to a specific patient with yeah, acoustic neuroma. So always the risk of pain, bleeding, infection. Mm -hmm. uh, hearing loss is a big, factor, not only right. in terms of the approach, uh, but in terms of management. Uh, some patients have hearing even with an acoustic neuroma. Okay. And then the question is, do we want to go in to try to preserve hearing, depending on a number of factors. Not everybody has that capability. Uh, the big thing has to do with tumor location, as well as tumor size. Um, uh, but let's say they do have hearing. One risk is their hearing loss. Could, they could conceivably lose all their hearing in that ear. Uh, tinnitus, so the ringing, that could actually get worse, uh, but it could also get, get better. Uh, dizziness is a, a risk that generally we, we'd like to think is transient. While, yes, going in after surgery, a lot of patients are very, very dizzy. We generally like to hope that patients after time and recovery with their good ear, that they will be able to get over their dizziness. Gotcha. Um, and then anytime we do brain surgery, always the risk of spinal fluid leak, stroke, and seizure. Uh, but then I, I want to go back to, to facial nerve. I mean, that is something that is very important for a lot of patients as well as us as surgeons. And it's something I know 20 to 30 years ago, a lot of people were very aggressive to take these tumors out. And I think that's part of the reason why we're now saying, hey, let's, let's calm down here. Maybe let's wash these before we really need to do something. And so uh, facial nerve injury, um, can happen, and that can be a subtle injury. That's something only maybe the patient and their family might notice in the mirror, mm -hmm. to something that can be a life-altering experience for those patients. Oh, wow. um, and while, again, it's a, a significant, um, uh, it's a complication and it affects, it does affect some people, mm -hmm. there are options for those, those patients afterwards. Um, so when you talk about it, are you talking about things as much as that they have a hard time smiling, they're, maybe their, their eyes, I mean, the best example I can give is I, I think most people are aware of at least someone that's had a stroke one time in their life where their face does not move. And uh, that would be worst case scenario from a facial nerve outcome. Okay. Um, so it might be an asymmetric smile. It might be not being able to smile. It might not be, it might mean not being able to close their eye. Um, sometimes, and it's, it's rare, but sometimes it's a, you, you get some movement in the upper division, but you don't get some movement in the lower division. It just it looks different. And some people, again, and that goes back to my statement about it might be so subtle that only the family might recognize mm -hmm. and they go out in public and it's not noticeable. For other people, unfortunately, it is it is noticeable. But that is a, a, a risk uh, of surgery that I think many people then consider radiation for as well. And right. so radiation, uh, we're always worried about uh, the risk of the tumor swelling transiently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then coming back down. So we generally try to limit the tumors in terms of size and what patients we offer uh, radiation. Right. 
There's a lot of controversy on whether or not people could develop facial nerve weakness from radiation. Mm -hmm. And I would generally, we generally counsel, I, I, I personally think it's probably around one to two percent. I think it's pretty low. Okay. It, it, I know it depends on the institution and what they report, but I, I think it's very rare. Okay. Um, the other concern we have a lot of those with those patients is dizziness. And so mm -hmm. historically we try to, those patients with dizziness generally are steered more towards surgery only because those patients can develop long-term dizziness that is not corrected. Um, okay. For those patients with hearing, we generally counsel that you will, there's a greater than 50% chance that you will lose your hearing. It could be tomorrow, it could be in 10 years. Uh, there's a, also the possibility that you have a difficult time resorbing the inner, the fluid inside the head. Okay. And so very rare we have to place a shunt. And then lastly, and I recognize it, it scares a lot of people, but the concern of if you radiate something, could it turn into a malignancy? And we have seen that, we just don't have a great great understanding of what the true rate is, but I, I generally counsel it's probably one in 5,000, one in 10,000. It's happened, I've seen it, Yeah. but it's rare. It's very rare, okay, that's, that's good to know. Thank you for such a thorough answer. So we have now a question from Stephanie that she wants to go back to what you were talking about, understanding more about the genetics behind mm -hmm. the tumors. Her question is, are there clinical studies people who have had tumors removed can participate in? Can we do anything like that here? So we are, we actually are running our own study where we actually take the tumor, when we take the tumor out surgery, surgically, we store the tumor. So wow. it, it's a, all the studies currently that are looking at that, I believe are all prospective, meaning right. either you have the tumor or the tumor's coming out. And so I know some of our colleagues up in Boston are not only taking the tumor out, but they're taking a, a nerve nearby to mm -hmm. use as a control. Um, I'm unaware of any study, we don't do one here, and I'm unaware of anywhere else where they're asking for patients after the fact, but that, okay. I say that now, and that's just maybe a lack of understanding on my part, uh, but that's not to say something like that might, might occur down the road. Okay, that's a really interesting question, Stephanie, thank you. We've got time for maybe two more questions, and we've gotta let Dr. Hunter go. One of the questions that came in here from the Brain Institute, they wonder, <laughs> after surgery, will, um, Will balance be permanently altered? I mean, you touched on that for a little bit. Yeah, I, I, like I never true. make any, I, I never make any promises to patients. I, I generally think the younger the patient, uh, the more likely that their balance could return. I, I generally, it's a simplistic analogy, but uh, imagine that the, the head is like an airplane, and you have two jet engines, and by taking the tumor out, maybe we lose one jet engine, but the plane can still fly, and so. Generally, younger patients, uh, and when I say younger, I, I think, and we're not really generally offering surgery beyond 65, mm -hmm. really no later than 70, can recover. But there are some patients with some persistent disequilibrium. Um, but that is a concern. Uh, but that goes back to the radiation. That, there, was, there was some concern by radiating these patients, uh, the dizziness might not recover as well. And I do question that thought, uh, but it, there's just, I mean, it's still too early to unilaterally state that that no radiation doesn't hurt the balance system at all. But that is a risk. Okay. Okay. Last question. Sure. So, are there, what are, are there any new breakthroughs either in technology or in treatments in relation to acoustic neuroma that people should look for on the horizon? Um, I do think the paradigm of managing these is different, and so okay. with the idea that. I think a lot of people are generally observing the appropriately observable ones, meaning tumors that are small. Mm -hmm. um, whereas 20 to 25 years ago, I think generally thought we got to take it out. So, yeah. I, I, and I don't know if that's understood or recognized by everybody. Uh, that th there's no guarantee that these things will grow. Now we are, and I say we here at UT Southwestern as well as other institutions are looking at things that trying to figure out by taking those tumors out, are there things we can do to help predict which tumors might grow or things that might prevent growth? And so we don't have the, we're not participating in this clinical trial, but I know one, one group's looking at uh, anti-inflammatories as a possible means of preventing the growth. Okay. And I personally, there's controversy with that with, in my own research to find that there is no correlation between Advil and Aleve and ibuprofen growth, um, but other groups have found that different. Uh, that being said, they were poorly designed studies, and that's why they're uh, doing a clinical trial to look to see if that might help. Uh, they're also, I know, I, and I know this is only in animals, they're looking at other possible 
uh, medicines that they've actually been used to treat other I issues that they've actually found maybe some correlation in tumors. That is not into a clinical trial yet, as far as I know, but I do think that would be on the near horizon of being able to offer some patients that uh, to see if that might prevent the growth. Um, but that's kind of where we're at right now. I mean, okay. treatment-wise, we're still surgery radiation. Um, and again, each patient's care is kind of individualized to the patient. Right. But um, uh, I mean, we are, we're working, we're working at it. Um, so hopefully, hopefully sooner rather than later. later. Okay, good to know. So that is all the time we have today. I wanna to thank everybody for all the wonderful questions. Don't forget, this chat will be available here on our Facebook page, and we'll also share it on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. That's youtube.com slash UTSWMed. And a special thanks to the Acoustic Neuroma Association, but more importantly to Dr. Hunter for answering all these wonderful questions. Well, today. thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So thank you, and have a great day.